And if you would please, we're going to start reading in verse number one, and we're going to go down to verse number four. You glad to be in church this evening? Amen. God is good. I love the weather. We have had such good weather. I'm excited about spring has sprung, and it's going to be nice now. I know we're going to get a little bit of rain next week and maybe just a couple of flurries, but nothing like wintertime. It's all behind us. Amen. All righty. So Colossians chapter 3, and if you would please look down at verse number 1. The Bible says this, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. For 45 weeks now, we have taught on these things, and we found 45 different passages in the Bible where the subject, these things, have come up. So for the last five sermons on this topic of these things, I found five passages in the Bible where it actually says those things. If you look at verse number one, it says, if ye then being, uh, be risen with Christ, here's what it says, seek those things which are above. So tonight, the title of my message, if you're taking notes, is this. These things, part number 46, and here's the subtitle, Seek Those Things Which Are Above. That's what it says in verse number one. Seek those things which are above. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Jesus. I really do with all of my heart. And I thank you, Lord, for the privilege you've given me to be a pastor for all of these 28 and a half years. And Lord, I love these people here tonight and those who are watching online. And Lord, I just pray that you meet with us in a very, very real and special way. Holy Spirit of God, touch all of our hearts, change our lives for the better. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice that needs to be saved or needs to be baptized, of course, help them to make those important decisions tonight. And Father, please just do a work in our lives and we'll give you all the glory. We'll thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Seek those things which are above. By way of introduction, I'm going to give you eight points tonight. If you'd like to take notes, please have your pens and papers handy. But by way of introduction, I want to bring to your light two different words that are mentioned, or, or actually three words, um, in verses 1 and 2. The first word, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above. So I'd like to bring to your attention the word seek, okay? So by way of introduction, when it comes to those things which are above, God admonishes us to seek after them. So what does the word seek mean? It means this, to go in search or quest of, to endeavor to find. Often I've thought about the word seek in the Bible, like when it comes to prayer. In Matthew 7, God says, ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find. Well, I think of that word seek not as just simply casually looking in a room for something that you've lost. Have you ever lost your car keys or your wallet or your cell phone? I mean, come on, something that's really important to you. And then you're just looking and looking and looking and looking and looking. I'll tell you a story. Um, I, I'm very particular when it comes to numbers. And I was, I was doing the, um, I was preparing the financial report uh, for the month of uh, April, the month that we're in right now. And I was updating the financial records and there was $60 missing on the report. And I spent a solid hour scouring over the records. So where in the world is this $60? It, it showed in one spot, and it didn't show in another spot. And then I finally found it. I mean, I finally found it. And then I was like, oh, I should have had a V8. You know, I mean, it was like, good night. How did I not see that? It's right there in plain sight, you know? And so, but it took me an hour, and I was not going to stop scouring over those records until I found out where that $60 was. Uh, the Bible talks about a lady who lost a coin, and it said that she swept her whole house and did not stop until she found that coin. I think in the Bible where it talks about a shepherd who had 100 sheep, 
and, and, and one got lost, got, got astray. And he left the 90 and nine, and he went searching for that one lost sheep until he found it. And then when he found it, he brought it back to the fold. Now, that's what I think of when I see the word seek. It's not just a casually, oh, where's it at? Oh, man, I, I hope I find it. No, it's like looking for something intently. It's having a desire that, that you want to find it, and you'll take as long as it takes to find it, and you'll exhaust all ends to find it. All right, so when it says there in verse number one, seek those things which are above, the word seek means to go in search or quest of, to endeavor to find. And again, it's not one of those casual things. It's one of those things like you're giving it your all to find it. Then the next thing I'd like you to look at is verse number two. It says, set your affection on things above. That's those things that it says in verse number one, not on things on the earth. Okay, so the, the, the two words I like to bring to your attention here is set and affection. Set and affection. Now, this particular term for the word affection is not a fondness. You know, some of you can, you know, look at a, a puppy dog on the, on the uh, you know, Facebook or social media and you'll go, oh, how cute, how adorable. And what you're saying is you fondly like that, that picture, you know, that little puppy dog. Now, it's another thing entirely for you to buy that puppy dog or get it and have it as your own and train it and go through the process of, you know, uh, potty training a puppy or house training a puppy dog and, and you know, going through all of that and, and waking up in the middle of the night and taking them out to go to the bathroom, trying to teach them not to go to the bathroom in the house and all of that. So you can have an affection as you look at things that is like a fondness. But that's not what this affection is mentioned in the Bible. The word affection there is, is talking about a deep love and devotion or a passion. A deep love and devotion or a passion. All right, so when you see in verse number two, it says, set your affection on things above. He's not saying just be fond about it. Oh yeah, it's nice that we're going to heaven. It's nice that Jesus is risen. It's nice that we're on the winning side and we're Christians and all that. It's just so nice to be a Christian. No, no. God says don't that's not the affection that he's referring to. He is actually saying be deeply devoted, have a deep abiding love and a passion for things above. One of the ways I kind of correlate that idea to you is some people, they go to church casually. Sometimes people are like, well, if I've got nothing else better to do, you know, I'll go to church. A lot of times people um, that are sports fans that are passionate about sports, you know, in, the, in football season, if their favorite football team, like the Broncos, are playing during church, they'll stay home and watch the Broncos because that's in their mind, that's something better to do. And so what that means is church is more of a, um, well, if I've got nothing else better to do, it's more of a, a fondness. And then there's those of us that we're, we're devoted. I mean, like, deeply devoted. It's like whenever the doors are open, we want to be there. And we want to, because we love the Lord and we love God's house. And so that's the difference. And so God says, it says to seek those things which are above, that's to go in search or quest of, to endeavor to find. And then he says, set your affection on things above. That means have a deep love and devotion or passion. Now, what are these things on which are above that we're supposed to seek and to set our affection on? Brother David, I gotta tell you this before I forget, we had a light bulb go out tonight while I was preaching. So we gotta change that before tomorrow's service. All right, just whew, threw that out there so I don't forget. All right, here we go. I can't stand light bulbs that go out in the auditorium. I just can't. Now, okay, everybody look at it. There it is right there. All righty, it's out for sure. Okay, now let's get focused on this sermon again. All right, I'm gonna give you eight things that God admonishes us through his word that we're supposed to seek and to set our affection on. All right, number one. Look at Psalm 73. Go near Old Testament, please, to the book of Psalms, chapter number 73. And I'd like to read two verses with you, verses 25 and 26. All right, Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. All right, 
Psalm chapter 73, we're going to start reading in verse number 25. In Psalm 73 and verse 25, it says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verse number 25, the psalmist is saying, and this is a psalm of Asaph, one of uh, the musicians in David's time, but it says this, it says, whom have I in heaven but thee? And then he said, there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. All right, when the Bible tells us, seek those things which are above, the first thing we gotta write down, number one, write down God. Just write down God. That's who we spend time with. Who we spend time with. Now listen carefully. There are those people in your life that you are passionate about, that you have a deep devotion and love for. Most of the time, we would call them family. If you're married, it could be your spouse. If you're a parent, it would be your children. If you have um, closeness in your family as far as siblings, it could be your brother, it could be your sister, uh, it could be your mom and dad, all of those things. Now, listen carefully, none of those things are bad. God admonishes us to be there for our family, to love our family. In fact, the Bible says a husband's supposed to love his wife just like Christ loved the church, all right? All those things are fine. But here's one thing that you should always seek after. One thing you should always set your affection on, and that is God, 100%. I, I was talking to someone on the phone this evening, or this afternoon, before church, and he was talking to me about just his life situations with his family and some of the trials he's going through. And here's what he said. He said, no matter what happens in this trial, he said, I always love God first and foremost. And that's really what we're supposed to do. Now, if you seek after God, and if you set your affection on God, then guess what you'll do? You'll read your Bible every day. You'll pray every day. You'll make it a concentrated effort to spend time with God because you're setting your affection upon him, because you are seeking him. Again, We've got no problem doing that with people in our world, in our lives that we love. And again, it's not wrong to love people. In fact, God says, love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, God even goes on to say, love your enemy. Don't hate them, love your enemy. So obviously you're supposed to love people. And obviously the ones that you're supposed to be the closest to in this world should be your family. But God should always take number one. God should always be first, 100% of the time. What sat in our country what I've seen in 28 years of being a pastor is the average Christian has a fondness of God, not a deep love or a deep devotion. A lot of times in our, in our society, we don't really seek after God. We're just casual observers, casual seekers. In other words, well, if it's just right smack dab in front of my face and it's not too difficult to go after, yes, I'll go after God. Well, the fact of the matter is that's not the way that God explains it. If, if we seek after God, we should have a passion. We should have a, a devotion. We should be searching in quest of. We should endeavor to find. In other words, we should say, God, I'm going to put you on my schedule today, and I'm going to put you on the top of my schedule. If you've ever gone through your life day by day, and you get to the end of your day, and you're tired, and you're going to bed, and you're like this, oh, I didn't read my Bible today. Oh, I didn't pray today. Do you know why? It's most likely because something else took the priority. I mean, that's the, that's the honest truth. Because if God took the priority, you wouldn't miss him. Have you, ever, have you ever woke up and lived your day and got to the end of the day and you're like, oh, I forgot to eat today. I just completely forgot to eat. No, chances are, I mean, unless you're fasting, right? I mean, if you're fasting, you're not forgetting to eat, you're, you're fasting and praying instead of eating, right? But besides fasting and praying, typically speaking, you don't just live your life and say, oh, I forgot to eat today. Do you know why? <laughs> because eating's important, right? I mean, it really, really is. Um, if you work a, a job 
let's say Monday through Friday. Has there ever been a Monday that you just lived your whole day and then at the end of the day you're going to bed and you're like, oh, I completely forgot to go to work today. I just didn't go to work. Can you imagine, sweetheart, uh, not going to class, <laughs> teaching in our school? Oh, wow, there was something I was supposed to do. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to go to school today and teach my class. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine, right? It would just be like, no, I would never do that. And, that's, and again, that's good. Why? Because eating is important, work is important, but how much more important is God? How much more important is it that you would say, I'm going to read my Bible today. I am going to pray today. I am going to spend time with God. Seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above. And number one, it starts with God. Number two, look at Psalm chapter 16. Psalm chapter number 16, please. Psalm chapter number 16. And I'd like you to look down, if you would, at verse number 11. Y'all still glad to be here this evening? You know what church is supposed to do? It's supposed to be instructive. It's supposed to be inspiring. Sometimes it's supposed to be a rebuke. Sometimes it's supposed to be convicting. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I'm not all that I'm supposed to be yet. And sometimes when I preach convicting messages, God's already preached them to me before I preached them to you. And I figure, man, if I could benefit from this truth, maybe you could too, right? I mean, that's kind of how preaching is. That's how it goes. I'm not up here saying I got my act all together and all bunch of you heathen, wicked sinners, get your hearts right with God tonight. No, that's not it at all. But I do want to inspire you. I want to help you. I want to convict you. And if need be, sometimes rebuke you. All right, look at Psalm chapter 16. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says this, one of my favorite verses in all the scripture. In Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 11, the Bible says, thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore number one I said about seeking those things which are above we say number one God number two write this down God's will God's will you say what is God's will well it says it right there thou wilt show me the path of life now this is not the path that you walk on just for the day this is not just somewhere to go to occupy today. This is not just something to do to find something to do today. The phrase, the path of life, it's talking about your overall journey of life. What is it that you're pursuing? What's your career? When you get to the end of your life, it's as you look back and reflect on it, it's what do you want to be remembered as? What is your path of life? Now, it goes on to say, the psalmist David says to God, you, God, thou, will show me the path of life. Then he goes on this. In, the pre in thy presence is fullness of joy. And then he says this. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So what does the right hand of God signify? It doesn't mean you're just close to him. That's not what it's talking about. The right hand of God is this. It's when you sit at his right hand and you say, God, I am ready to do whatever you want me to do. I'm at your right hand. You give the word and I'll do it. Let me give you an example about that. When Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection, where did he go? Where's he at right now? At the right hand of the Father. And what does he say in the word? He said, I am sitting at the right hand of the Father, and here's what he says, I am waiting for the Father to say, go get your children. That's the rapture. So Jesus says, I don't know the hour. He says, no man knows the hour. He said this, only the Father in heaven knows when the hour is that I'm going to come back. And so Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now, not because of closeness, not because of relationship, but he's sitting there saying, you give me the order and I'm ready to go. And that's what it is about the path of life being God's will for your life. You know, when I was 17 years of age, it's an old story, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but when I was 16 years of age, God called me to be a preacher. 
for seven uh, for uh, for a whole year i resisted i wanted to do something else i wanted a career in sports i either wanted to be a professional athlete or i wanted to somehow cover professional athletes as a sports photographer sports writer an announcer a radio talk show host i mean just whatever the case may be that was man i wanted that man a career in sports i loved sports even to this day at age 53 i still have a desire in my heart for sports and i and i and i know that the denver nuggets are going to win the championship this year i just know it i just know it regardless of what sam and, and zachary have to say about it um but uh the nuggets are going to win brother isaac if you'd help me out and talk to your boys about that i sure would appreciate that but anyway yeah, help them to get on the on the on the program but but anyway, I, I love sports, and I, that's, what I, that, that's what my path of life was going to be. But when God came to me at age 16 and then talked to me for a whole year at age 17, he basically came to me and said, look, he said, he said, I want you to be a preacher. And he said, I'm not going to ask you again. This is what he said to me. He said, but if you want to live to see your 18th birthday, you better say yes to me. I mean, that's literally what I felt in my spirit, God speaking to my spirit. And I responded and I said, God, you're serious about this, aren't you? And he said, absolutely am I serious about this. And so at age 17, on June 14, 1987, I walked down the aisle at Hopewell Baptist Church in Napa, California, and I, I surrendered my life to be a preacher at the altar. And that's when I said, okay, God, I'm yours. The path of life that I'm going to walk down, I'll put myself at your right hand, and you give the order, and I'll go. Then God said, go to Bible college. I went. God said, marry Pamela Diane Harbor. I did. God said, move to Longmont, Colorado, start Hopewell Baptist Church. I did, and he hasn't told me anything else since. So, I mean, here, I'm here, right? Amen. 28 and a half years, and uh, God hadn't told me to go anywhere else. So, um, but I'm in that path of life that God's called me. It's at his right hand. It's God's will. And guess what I had to do? I had to say, I'm going to seek it. I had to say, I'm going to set my affection on it. Deep love and devotion and passion for God's will for my life. Now listen carefully. God has a will for your life. I've taught you this and taught you this and taught you this. You are not an accident to God. You are not an uh-oh. God did not look down from heaven and say, well, I'll declare, where did you come from? I better give you something to do to keep you busy so you don't get in trouble. Um, that's not God. God had a plan for your life before you were ever conceived. There was something that God needed done, and he made you to fulfill that purpose. Now, the most fulfilling life. David said, at thy right hand, there are pleasures forever. Uh, uh, joy. Let's see. He said, um, let me get it exactly right. He said, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So here's what he says. If you'll live in God's will, you'll have fullness of joy. If you live in God's will, you'll have pleasures forevermore. And I found that to be true. In 1987, I surrendered my life to the Lord, and I said, I'll go on the path of life that you want me to go down. And now for these 30 36 years, I have been on the path that God has set for me. And I'm going to tell you, even though the devil fights, even though there's been battles, even though there's been difficulties, I have in my heart today fullness of joy. And I have pleasures that will last into eternity. I got to see a sweet 83-year-old lady saved today. She was born in Czechoslovakia. I say that right, Czechoslovakia, uh, but uh, Czechoslovakia, <laughs> I can't say it right now. And uh, she, as a child, was in labor camps. She was born and lived during World War II. She grew up in Germany. She moved here in 1958. She got married. Her husband and her lived in Pennsylvania. And through the providence of God, she made it to Longmont, Colorado. She's lived in the apartments that I met her in today, I think she said for four years now. And I knocked on her door, and it was just an amazing, amazing soul-winning experience. I didn't even have to ask her if I could talk to her about the Bible, how to go to heaven or not. She, after just a couple minutes, she said, come on in. Me and my partner walked in, and she was so friendly, so open. And, and she said to me after we were done, she goes, I don't normally do this to religious people. 
But I just felt like there was something you had to say that I needed to hear. And I got to share the gospel with her and her got saved. She got saved. It was so sweet. She already had plans for Resurrection Sunday tomorrow. So she said she'll come to church next Sunday if my wife will pick her up. So I got to give you the address after the service, you know. And, um, but she wants to come visit our church. Now, she was raised her entire life in a religion that did not tell her how to be saved. And I told her, I said, ma'am, I don't care what religion you are. I just want to teach you the Bible so you can know you're going to heaven. And she said, I want to hear. You know what? That is called pleasures forevermore. Because when I get to heaven, she'll be there. She'll be there forever. I mean, because I'm in God's will. Can you imagine if I wasn't in God's will? I would have never met that lady from Czechoslovakia. Kia and um, 83 year old lady and, and who knows if anybody else would God would have had to go by and knock on her door I don't know but I know God called me to do that and she got saved I'm telling you there's fullness of joy pleasures forevermore in God's will you need to seek these things and you need to set your affection on number three look at Proverbs chapter 15 go to Proverbs 15 again we got eight things we're going to teach you tonight Proverbs chapter 15 and uh, look down at one verse verse number 24 <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 15, and uh, if you would please look down at verse number 24. Proverbs chapter 15, and look down at verse number 24, all right? Now, this is a little bit different. I'm going to explain to you why than what we just read. Proverbs 15, 24, it says, The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. Okay, so what are these things above that we're supposed to seek and set our affection on? Number, number three, it says the way of life. Here's what that is. Ready? Write this down. Heaven on earth. Write that down. Heaven on earth. Okay, there's a difference between the way of life and the path of life. The path of life is more about your purpose in life, your direction, where are you going, when your life is over, what do you want to be remembered as? The way of life is this. It's basically just simply the way we live. That's what it's talking about, how we live our lives day to day, like how we treat each other. You know, um, how, how do we treat our enemies? Do we forgive people that wrong us? Do we, do we ask for forgiveness when we wrong others? Do we treat people like Christ would want us to treat them? Do we live our lives saying, what would Jesus do if he were in my shoes? That's what the way of life is talking about. And so it says there in verse number 24, the way of life is where? It is above. Remember, we're supposed to seek those things which are above. We're supposed to set our affections on things above. And so it says this, the way of life is above to whom? To those who are wise. But then it says that he may depart from hell beneath. Now, what's that talking about? That means you don't have to live in hell on earth. How many times have I talked to people over the years as I've been out soul winning? And I say to them, do you know if you die today, you go to heaven? And I say, well, there's heaven and hell, you know? And then a lot of times people say, well, I'm living in hell right now. Well, what does that mean? Here's what that means. The way of life that they're choosing to live is from hell beneath. That's what Proverbs 15, 24 just said. But God says, if you're wise, your way of life will be from above. Well, what's above? It's not hell. Above is heaven. So that's talking about having heaven on earth. So here's what I believe right now. I believe that as a saved person, you have a destination of heaven one day. When you die because you're saved, you are going to a place that is called heaven. And that's everlasting life. But there's something called eternal life which is different than everlasting. Eternal life is a quality of life. Everlasting life is a quantity of life. So here's what God says. When you get to heaven, you're going to have everlasting life. Quantity. You're going to live in heaven forever because you're saved. But also in heaven, there is eternal life, which is more about a quality of life. So you know what God says? If you'd learn to seek those things which are above, set your affection on things above by meaning you're going to choose the way of life that is above, that means you can have a quality of life 
that is heaven on earth. You know, don't, don't sit there and say, well, you know, we're just going to have trials and problems and tribulations in this world. It's just going to be hell on earth right now. No, no, you don't have to live in hell on earth right now. You can live in heaven on earth. You really can. It's more about a quality of life. Now, guess what? If you want heaven on earth, if I were to ask you, how many of you want to have heaven on earth right now until you get to heaven? Every one of you should, you know, I'll raise my hand to that. I want to have heaven on earth. Okay, you got to seek after it. You got to set your affection after it. Heaven on earth doesn't just happen. God doesn't just like sprinkle poofy dust all over us and there you go, you got heaven on earth. No, you got to seek after it. You got to set your affection on it. You got to say, I love, okay, let me give you an example. You ready for this? You want heaven on earth? Ready for this? There's a kind of music that God allows in heaven. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You want heaven on earth? One of the ways you do that is you sing the songs now that you're going to sing in heaven. Stop singing the world's songs. The world's music is more representative of hell beneath as it is opposed to heaven above. But listen, I'm not talking about church now. I'm talking about your whole life. What kind of music do you listen to? Do, do you want to have heaven on earth? Okay, well, then you've got to have the quality of heaven. You've got to seek the way of life. Okay, not just music, but watch this, behavior. I often tell people this, you ain't going to be cussing in heaven. <laughs> Can you imagine God having a bar of soap in every mansion? <sighs> If I hear a cuss word from you, you're getting that bar of soap today. <laughs> Can you, I mean, it's not happening, right? We're not cussing up in heaven, so why are we cussing now? Do you know why? Because you are living in hell beneath. That's, that's the way of life you've chosen, right? Um, how about unforgiveness? You know what? Up in heaven, everybody's forgiven. Not just from Jesus, but from all of us. You know, when you get to heaven, you're not going to look at someone who's saved, who wronged you, and go like this for all eternity. <laughs> you know what you're going to have in your heart for that person in heaven? You're going to have forgiveness in your heart when you get to heaven. So you want heaven on earth now? Have forgiveness now. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All nine of those qualities are the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to have it all. Up in heaven one day. You know what God says? You want to have heaven on earth now? Why don't you have love now? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Have that now, and you'll have heaven on earth now. But again, you got to seek after it. you got to set your affections on it. If you just casually do whatever does life, you know, comes your way, it's gonna, your life is going to be more representative of hell beneath than it is going to be heaven above. Now, you've got to seek after it. So what should we seek? Those things which are above, number one. Who should we seek? Okay, so, uh, Miss Kim, thank you. Was that you that said that? You're the only one. All right, here we go. Y'all weren't, y weren't, weren't ready for a pop quiz, were you? Okay, here we go, pop quiz. Number one, who should we seek? First of all, number one, God. Number two, God's will. Number three, Heaven on earth, number four. Oh, I hadn't told you yet. Okay, turn to Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. Let's get to number four. All right, Matthew chapter six. God tells us in Colossians three, verse one, seek those things which are above. In verse two, he says, set your affection on things above. All right, so this is all part of it. Matthew chapter six. You remember Matthew chapter six? It's the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It is possibly the greatest sermon that has ever been recorded in the history of sermons. I think of a lot of sermons that have been recorded, um, either audio or video or written down. I think of uh, R.G. Lee preaching Payday Someday. Man, what a famous sermon. You know, what a famous sermon. I remember um, uh, Brother Hiles preaching possibly his most famous sermon, uh, Fresh Oil. I mean, wow, you know, what a famous sermon. Um, th there was another, um, oh, I, I just lost the name of, of um, uh, Jonathan, let's see, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Jonathan Edwards, is that who that was? What an incredible sermon. 
sinners in the hands of an angry God, right? I, I, I heard, you know, I read the books where it said as he was preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God, there were people in the church building that were clawing the pillars of, of the church saying, God, please don't let me go to hell while he was preaching it. I mean, it was such a convicting sermon. But the greatest of all sermons, in my opinion, was the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus Christ. And if you look at Matthew chapter 6, and you look down at verse number 19 through 21, look what it says. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, number four, write this down, eternal treasures. Write that down, number four, eternal treasures. What are we supposed to seek after? Or what are we supposed to set our affections on? Those things which are above? Well, what does God say is above? He says treasures in heaven. It literally says lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, what does that mean? That means invest in heaven invest. Now, those of us that know much about investing, you know, there's all kinds of stocks, there's all kinds of bonds, there's all kinds of companies and places that you can, you know, invest your money in today. And and some of that can turn out to be a profitable investment. Some of it could be not so profitable, you know. And uh, But, but there, those of us that have any kind of investing mind or think about what we've invested in in the past, it's not just money, though, that God's talking about. Uh, investing your talents is also included in this. Investing your time is also included. One preacher worded it this way, when it comes to laying up treasures in heaven, it's your time, talents, and treasures. And those are the three T's that is talking about investing in heaven. Now watch this carefully. Some of us in America, we spend our entire lives investing in things on earth. And when we get to heaven, there'll be no treasures in heaven when we get there that we invested in. You know, you've heard me say this before. I've never seen a U-Haul pulled by a hearse. You're not taking it with you, folks. God, you know, remember the story of the rich man in the, in the gospel of Luke? He had so much treasure, so much goods, and so much stuff. It was overflowing his barns. And he said, I know what I'll do. He goes, I'm going to build bigger barns where I can put all my goods and all my stuff. And Jesus said to him, thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. And then whose shall those things be? You remember Job, the wealthiest man in the East in his day? He lost it all in one day. But here's what he said. He said about his heart, his attitude. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? So here's what I'm saying. Don't, don't put all your investing, all of your treasures on things of this earth. Invest in eternity, time, your talents, your treasures, treasures being, you know, finances, right? So here's what God says. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Don't just stockpile treasures. Don't just invest all of your investment in things on earth. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why? He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm so glad that my wife and I are like-minded in this. When we got married, before we got married, of course, my wife and I talked about what our future would be if we're on the same page. And we, we praise the Lord, for 31 years now, we have been on the same page. This coming, um, this coming May will be 31 years complete that we've been married, and uh, we're excited about that, you know. But for 31 years, we've never argued or fought or had any kind of conflict over treasures. And we freely invest in the kingdom of God. And God has been so good to us, but my wife and I, we're on the same page. We have no problem spending our lives investing in heaven, laying up treasures in heaven. Now, while we're laying up treasures in heaven, God's taking care of us. We have a beautiful house. I got my truck back on Wednesday after 21 weeks of fix or repair daily. I got my Ford F-150 back. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I thank God the dealership gave me a loaner the whole time. I put 8,000 miles on their loaner. And so, praise God, whatever the case may be. But there's nothing like having my own truck back. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but, you know, um, God's been good to us. You know, my wife has a vehicle. I have a vehicle. We have a nice house. We have, we, you know, God's been keeping us relatively healthy. You know, once my wife and I both crossed the 50 threshold, our bodies are kind of letting us know that things are different now. But, um, but praise the Lord, relatively speaking, you know, God's given us a clean bill of health for all the years that we've been here, you know. And, uh, you know, my wife and I don't have health insurance at all. And we haven't had health insurance since 2001. And so for the last 22 years, and uh, we have catastrophic health coverage so you know we have a christian health care ministry that that we've invested in as far as monthly and if anything is like twenty thousand dollars or above then they come in they pay it all but anything below twenty thousand dollars we pay out of pocket for everything you know whatever it is and um but but god's been good to us we've never we've never needed it you know we've we've had and it's not because we're better than anybody it's just that it's just the grace of god I mean, just the grace of God. And, and you know, God's been good. But I'm going to tell you this. My wife and I love investing in eternity, our time, our talents, our treasures. I think there's a lot of people that are going to be shocked that when they die and get to heaven, they're going to realize the majority of their life that they lived was only for this temporal life instead of for eternity. And when they get to heaven, they're going to be there, but they're not going to have treasures up there because they didn't seek it. They didn't set their affection on it, but we should. What should we seek? What should we set our affections on? Number one, God. Number two, God's will. Number three, heaven on earth. Number four, eternal treasures. Number five, look at Matthew 6. Look down at verse 33. Look at verse 33. It says this, but seek ye first. Now that word first does not mean only. It does mean first in priority, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What should we seek or set our affections on? Number five, write down God's kingdom. God's kingdom. Now, first, what does that mean? Over the world's kingdom. You know, there is a kingdom of this world. We live in America, the kingdom of America. That's what it is, right? And uh, practically speaking, God says, seek God's kingdom first over that kingdom. Then there's a second kingdom or a third kingdom. There's your kingdom. What is your kingdom? That is your job, your career, your family, your world, right? So here's what God says. Seek ye not only, don't, don't, don't misunderstand God. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God above the world's kingdom, above your kingdom. And then here's what he said. If you do that, he says, all these things shall be added unto you. How many times have I gone door knocking and met people and said, would you like to come to church Sunday? And they're like, oh, I just don't have time. I, I don't have time. You know, I've had people tell me, so-and-so has more time to go to church than I do. I'm like, what? They have more time? You know, last I remember, all of us have 168 hours in a week. <laughs> Nobody has 180 hours in a week. Right, Brother David? I know we wish we had more time, but, um, but the fact is, we all have 168 hours in a week. Nobody has more time than anybody else. Here's what we do. We prioritize things differently. All right, there are four kingdoms in this world. There's God's kingdom. There's the kingdom of our country that we live in, which happens to be America. There's our kingdom. That's our family, our careers, you know, our, our, our world, right? And then there's the kingdom of Satan, okay? So there are four kingdoms. So God says, not only, but he says, put my kingdom first. And then he said, I'll take care of your kingdom. Because the whole teaching of Matthew 6 is the whole, you know, Gentiles seek after food and they clothing. And God says, don't, don't seek for those things. You know, what shall we eat? What shall we wear? You know, all this stuff. God says, if you put my, it says in verse 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. And then he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things things clothing and food and all of these things that the gentiles seek after all these things shall be added unto you it's all about priority what do you prioritize in your life god says put my kingdom first now how are you going to do that you got to seek it and you got to set your affection on it the kingdom of god in 2023 is in his local new testament church 
That's where it is. The kingdom of God is, it, this is it right here. This is what it's all about. In the Old Testament, it was different. It was the nation of Israel. It was the temple. It was the, uh, the synagogues, all of that. But when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, there was a shift. And that's why there's a New Testament. The Old Testament is not the main focus right now. Right now in 2023, the main focus is the New Testament. And the New Testament is all about the church, the house of God. And that's where the kingdom of God is thriving. That's where it's engaged. That's where it's all about. And God says this, you seek his kingdom first. He goes, I'll take care of your kingdom. And that's what it means to set our affection or seek after and setting our affection on things which are above. Number six, look at Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, please. You know, what I am doing tonight is I'm just preaching the Bible. I'm just bringing to your attention passages of Scripture that God wants us to be focused on. And this is your Bible just as much as it is mine. And this is a book written to you just as it is, 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 it is written to me. All right? Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 6. Ready? Look at this now. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Look at this, number six. Write this down. Thoughts of the Spirit. Thoughts of the Spirit. What does it mean to seek after those things which are above? What does it mean to set your affection on things that are above? It means make your thoughts. To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life. And then it goes on to say in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You know what God says? You want to please me? You can't do it in the flesh. You've got to do it in the spirit. And where does that begin? It begins in your mind. You know what you do? Your mind Basically, while you're awake, it never sleeps. Do you realize that while you're awake, there's always something on your mind? Now, I thank God that our mind and our thoughts are not broadcasted to everybody else so they can see it. <laughs> are you glad about that too? Man, I'm telling you what, man. I'm glad about that myself. But here's the thing. <laughs> you know your thoughts. God knows your thoughts. Let me ask you a question. What do you, generally speaking, what do you think about all the time? Things of the flesh? Sinful things? Things that are carnal? Do, do you think about just this physical world that we live in, just this life? Or do you have thoughts that are on the things above, the things of the Spirit? The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. It's kind of like Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. To be carnally minded is death. But if you want your life to count for something, then you've got to be spiritually minded. You've got to mind the things of God, the things of the Bible. That's why the Bible talks about um, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The more you get God's word in your heart and in your mind, the less sinning that you're going to be doing. Why? Because you're thinking about it. What does the Bible say in Proverbs? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Before you ever do anything, you think about it first. Before you ever do anything. Now, it may be brief. Sometimes we don't think very long. <laughs> You know, a lot of reacting, right? You know, we just blurt out what's on our, on our mind without thinking about it in detail. But I guarantee you, you never say anything that it, it wasn't first in your thoughts. You don't just blurt out words and you're like, where did that come from? It was in your mind before it came out of your mouth. Now, you may not think a long time on it. You may just be real quick to jump to speak, which is foolish, amen? Foolish, you don't want to do that. But here's the thing, if you, want a, if you want a good Christian life, the life that God wants you to live, a life of life and not death, you've got to start thinking thoughts of the Spirit. Think thoughts of the Spirit. Set your affection on things above. Seek things above. That's including your thoughts. 
Number seven, we're almost done. Second Corinthians chapter four. <sighs> Go to second Corinthians now. Chapter number four. We got eight things and this is number seven. So we're, we're about halfway through, right? Is seven half of eight? No. <laughs> seven, second Corinthians four. Just see if you're paying attention. What was that? What's going on? That's right, rabbit trails, that's right. Second, stop letting those rabbits out. Second Corinthians chapter four, look down at verse number eight. Second Corinthians chapter, oh, verse 18, I'm sorry. Verse number 18. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 18, it says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Um, number seven, write this down. Look for the eternal. Look for the eternal. Okay, sit up straight. Let me give you a, a, a thought about what you look at. Okay, you ready for this? When it talks about what you look at, it's talking about what you are focused on. Okay, so watch this very carefully. Okay, let's suppose, Brother Lee, I am focused on you right now. I am looking at you intently. Yep, I know you're looking back, aren't you? I am focused on you. I see you clearly. Amen, Brother Lee? But guess who's in my peripheral? Brother Joshua right over here. I can barely vaguely make him out. I know he's sitting on row number three. His, it's very, you know, fuzzy or blurry because it's in my peripheral. Now, I'm focused on you, but I also know that Brother Joshua is there, right? So that's what God is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter number four. He says, look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal you know what he's saying he says focus on that which is eternal and let the temporal things be in peripheral now you're going to see both you're going to see that which is eternal and that which is temporal but he said don't let the things which are eternal be blurry don't let that be that which is peripheral vision he says you need to be focused on that which is eternal in other words What's your focus in life? What is it that you are concentrating on in life? Well, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it's supposed to be the things which are eternal. That's what we're supposed to focus on. So you know what that means? You ready for this? I got to go soul winning today. I got to see that 83-year-old lady saved today. It was a wonderful salvation experience. God was good. But let's suppose I, I leave church tonight and I drive home and I get a flat tire. Now that's temporal. That's something that's just temporary. The lady I got to see saved today, that's eternal. Now watch this carefully. If I go home tonight and I focus on that flat tire, I could be agitated, I could be angry, I could even be depressed. But if I focus, and then here's, in the peripheral is that lady that I got to see saved. But, but I'm focused on the flat tire. But let's suppose I focus on the lady getting saved and the flat tire is in the peripheral. You know what that means? I can still have joy in my heart even though I had a flat tire. I can go home and I can say, today was a good day. Because if I focus on the eternal, someone got saved today. But if I focus on the temporal, man, cotton picking, corn pulling, pea splitting, flat tire. <laughs> I got to tell you one thing. One of the least things I love in this world is flat tires. I mean, I'm just telling you that right now. It's one of the least things that I love the most. You know why? Because when I get a flat tire, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to leave this spot for probably another 45 minutes. I'm going to have to take the tire, jack it up, make sure the jack works. Man, I remember one time I got a flat tire with my Chevy Suburban, and it had one of those um, jacks or, or the poles that you had to stick it down that little tube all the way down the, the, the flat tire. The, the uh, spare tire was underneath the carriage, and you had to try to, you know, rotate it like this. And, and 
before I knew how to do it, I put it in backwards. And I'm trying to get that thing released, and I never could get it released. And I'm like, oh, it's just so frustrating, you know. And, uh, and then, then I've had, you know, other jacks that didn't work right, you know, things like that. So I know that when I get a flat tire, it's at the bare minimum going to be a 45-minute ordeal if, if I can figure it out, right? And, and by the end of the time, you know, I'm, you know, doing good not to bite someone's head off that's in the car with me. You know what I'm saying? But, but listen, that's human nature. Nobody enjoys that. I remember one time when I was in Bible college, um, it was in the wintertime in Indiana. Um, I can't remember what month it was, but it was nighttime, and I was driving home from the college to my apartment in Hammond. My wife was already home, and I got a flat tire, and it's pouring down rain. So I pulled out my umbrella, and I'm sticking my umbrella on my shoulder above my head and I got my hands on the tire trying to get all the lug nuts off and getting the jack up on the side there and, and the wind is blowing and the rain is coming down and, and I was getting soaked and here I am I'm having this umbrella I'm trying to you know it's nighttime and I did we didn't have cell phones back then so there was no light I didn't have a flashlight <laughs> you know so I mean it was so frustrating you know now if I went home, and, I, and honestly, I don't remember how I went home that night. I think I might have an idea. But if I went home that night, just focused on that flat tire, I probably wasn't very happy. I had just left a, a service at Howes Anderson College, a preacher's service. There was preaching, and I can't remember what the conference was, but God spoke to my heart during that service. So what was I going to be focused on? It was going to determine how my day ended. And that's kind of how it is for us. If you're focused on the temporal things, you're, not, you're going to have a lot of bad days. But if you're focused on the eternal things, you can have a lot of good things, a lot of good days, right? You ever talk to someone and say, how you doing today? I got up. It's a good day. Someone said, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm on this side of the dirt. <laughs> it's all about what you're focused on, right? When you're focused on debt, when you're focused on health, poor health, when you're focused on uh, relationship problems, when you're focused on flat tires, you're going to have a bad day. But God says don't do that. Look at things that are eternal, and that will help you to have good days. All right, number eight and last. Look at Philippians chapter 3. <sighs> Philippians chapter 3. Last passage, last point. I'll say a few comments about it, and then we're going to have the invitation and then go home. All right, Ephesians, Philippians. There we go. Philippians chapter 3, look at verses 20 and 21. Y'all still glad to be here tonight? Amen, Ski. Woohoo! That's how Czech Czechoslovakian people say amen. It's amen, Ski. Here we go. That was funny. I said, I Philippians chapter 3, look down at verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Look what it says now. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Number eight and last, what are we supposed to seek and set our affection on those things which are above? Number eight. The return of Christ. The return of Christ. Look what it says right there. It says, look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. When's that going to take place? <laughs> the rapture. The rapture. You know what God says? Why don't you live your life focused on that? Focus on Jesus may come back today. Listen to this carefully. I believe with all my heart Jesus could come back tonight. How many of you would be happy if he came back tonight? Woohoo! <laughs> That'd be awesome, right? Woo! What a blessing that would be. Our bodies will no longer be vile. We'll have a glorified body. We'll no longer ache. We won't wake up. We won't have headaches throughout the day. We won't have difficulties doing the things that we wish we could do when we were younger. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, everything's going to be perfect. It's going to be wonderful for all eternity. We're going to have a glorified body. And 
Jesus is going to make that possible. And the Bible says this, if you would live your life every day looking up to heaven, this could be the day. This could be the day. That's what it means to seek those things which are above. That's what it means to set your affection, your deep love, your devotion, your passion on things that are above. What are one of the things that are above? <laughs> the return of Christ. Do you know at any moment the trump of God could sound? Dun, 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 dun. Come up hither. The dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Woo! Isn't that exciting? See, if you lived your life every single day, man, Jesus, please come back tonight. Let, come back tonight. Oh, it'd be great if you came back tonight and you lived every day ready for his return. You see, the most valuable thing about the return of Christ as far as your attitude is concerned is if you really felt like it could happen today, you might live better. You might deal with that sin that you've been putting off. You might forgive the person that you have bitterness towards. You might start getting serious about the things of God. You might... Talk to your relative or friend about their salvation. I mean, if the Lord came back today, like tonight, at 10 o'clock tonight, let's suppose that's when it was. Is there anybody in your world, family or friends that you know that's not saved? Well, if you knew the Lord was going to come back tonight at 10 o'clock, you think you'd say something to him about getting saved? You think you'd give them the gospel? You think you would do something to help them to get saved? Because, I mean, if the Lord comes back today, that's it. Those that are saved are going to heaven. Those that are not are left behind. You see, if you lived your life every day with the idea that today could be the day, that means you're focused, you're thinking about the things that are above, you're, setting, you're, you're seeking after and setting your affection on those things that are above. It would help you to live a more dedicated and devoted life. Because once the Lord comes back, you know what happens when the Lord comes back? Everything stops. Your life is done. All the things that you said, I want to get around to doing in the future, you ain't doing them now. The people that you wanted to talk to about their salvation, the Lord, you know, you wanted to talk to them about it, it's too late now. Anything that you were like, well, one of these days, it'd be nice to do whatever. No, no. Once the Lord, once the Lord comes back, that's done. Everything's done. So live today as if he would come back today. That's what it means to seek those things which are above and set your affection on things that are above. What are these things that we're supposed to seek? What are these things we're supposed to set our affection on? Number one, God. Number two, God's will. Number three, heaven on earth. Number four, eternal treasures. Number five, the key, God's kingdom. Number six, the thoughts of the spirit. Number seven, looking at those things that are eternal. And number eight, the return of Christ. Seek those things which are above. Set your affection on those things, and you'll have a wonderful Christian life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for this word of God that is so precious to us. Thank you for all these verses that we've been able to read. Thank you for those that are here tonight in presence and those that have been watching online, Lord.